Okay, so now we're going to have a look at the software stack itself. So this is based on the example we did this morning. Uh, so it's the AT slave example. And we're now going to have a look at how all the software works uh, that allows us to do the LoRa protocol. So, so what we're going to see in this section, we're going to have a look at the gateway we're using. So we're going to have a look at our multi-tech gateway and network server, application server. Remember, it's a combined three-in-one box. Uh, we're then going to have a look at the software stack, which you can download from the st.com website. So i-cube-lr1. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at the AT slave project file. So this is our class A node um, firmware that we programmed in using the drag and drop uh, principles this morning. Then we're going to have a quick look at the IEEE 802 standard. So, so LoRa One actually uses some of the basics of the IEEE standard. So it's the same as Zigbee and Wi-Fi and that. The protocol and message handling starts off in the same way. Then we're going to have a look at our operational model, so our finite state machine that we've got controlling our LoRa stack. And then we're going to have a look at some of the other functions that make up the LoRa stack itself. So timers, low power modes, things like that. So this is the Multitech gateway. So this is my blue box here at the front of the room. Um, this is providing us with our gateway, network server and application server. So all the items are in this one box uh, that we have here at the front of the room. So the configuration for the network server side, so we can select our frequency band. So we're in the 868 EU. Uh, you can use it in the US as well, so you can change that around. So that we can get immediate responses, we've set our um, queue size to be one for our example. So this is just so that we can get the um, response back so that you can get your replies within the time frames. Over on the right hand side, we've got our unique ID for our network server and our particular network key that we're using. So this is so that we can identify our network server. LoRa, if you remember, is can be a public network. So there are one or two public ones out there, but it can also be a private network. So this is where your network key will be unique so that you can have your own private network um, within your site, your facility. And you can still have the local council's LoRa network broadcasting in the general area of where your site or facility is located. So these keys would be different at this point. We've also for development purposes, we're telling our gateway to disable the duty cycle. So this is the regulation side. So, so for, for development purposes, you can set your gateway here to ignore the EU regulations of 1% duty cycle. Um, as I say, we're disabling it just purely because we're only doing it for development purposes and these workshops. In reality, if you were using this multi-tech module for a proper application, then you would not have that ticked in the application. So that was the network side. So also, the application server is inside our blue box here. And this particular one is a Linux machine inside the multi-tech. So we have Node Red as our application server providing the functionality of what we do when we receive a LoRa message on our network. So this is the screenshot of what we've got programmed inside our multi-tech gateway. For the example we were doing this morning, we were receiving our LoRa message. We were changing the payload. So if you remember, our payload had to be in 
<clears throat> a structure that had the word moat inside it. And in our change payload, we are replacing moat with gateway response or GWRESP. And then we are transmitting that information back out over our LoRa network. So, so that's what we were doing in this morning's example. Also, we have the ability to, in the Node-RED software, to put in debug blocks. So, so we've got in the green elements there, we have a debug block so we can see exactly what we're receiving as our LoRa message. And then outside or the output of the change payload block, we have another debug um, block so we can see what we're then sending to the output on our LoRa system. So we can actually see what we receive and what we're then sending out based on the inbound messages. The items in the middle, the compare and the increase, decrease and equal, that's for this afternoon's um, hands-on. So this is where we're going to compare for our secret number or our temperature. And then depending on what the compare block says, we'll either send a message out that says increase, a message out that says decrease, or a message out to say, correct, we're equal. So we don't need to do any actual uh, changes at the other end. So, so this is all done graphically. So there's no writing of code. You just create all the blocks on your screen and then link all the blocks together um, to generate your application server. So this is the debug window that we've got on our application server. So in here you can see my uh, nice messages. So this was the inbound messages that contained the word moat. Um, and we have John Smith as our inbound message. And then our gateway response for the change payload will send the name out again, but it will change the word moat to gateway response. So as well as programming the application, you can also look at the debug of what's going on in your application um, in live terms. So you can see exactly what's going on inside there. So all this is happening inside our blue box that we've got. So on your desk, you had the node. So you've got the LoRa discovery board there. There is a user manual for this um, software package that we've programmed in our discovery board, so UM2073. Really good document, tells you everything that you need to know about the, um, the software package that we're using inside the LoRa Murata module. So when you open the uh, project in your Kyle environment or your chosen environment, uh, this is the structure that you will see. So remember, we only dragged and dropped the binary file into our LoRa board this morning. Um, if you want to open this now, you can do. Uh, and this is with the structure that you're going to see inside your Kyle environment. So we've got a documents folder, which has got a few explanations of some of the um, projects that are installed inside there. We've got our board support package. So this is for the discovery board, um, for all the other drivers that are needed to communicate with the rest of the chips that are um, integrated on the discovery board. You've got your standard CMSYS drivers uh, from ARM. So they're all integrated in there. You've got the HAL drivers and the low layer drivers from the STM32L0, which is the microcontroller that's inside the metal can. You've got the startup files from Kyle, so the MDK ARM startup files. Then we've got actually our project, so our AT slave project. So the first two C files are all the parts managing the different AT commands. So these are all doing the uh, decoding of the message that you're typing in on your laptop's uh, terminal window that's been sent into your module so it knows what to do to send out across the LoRa. 
debug, self-explanatory. Then we've got the relevant drivers that we're using to drive the hardware. So, so we are using the RTC. So the RTC is providing our timers so, so that we can keep the device in low power mode as long as possible. We're not using the SysTick or a conventional timer. We're using the RTC timer and it'll wake up on periodic alarms and that provides the timer ticks for our LoRa protocol stack. The SPI peripheral is what's actually driving the radio, so that's the link inside the Murata module that's communicating between the microcontroller and the radio chip. And there's various GPIO pins inside there as well, controlling some of the features. So, so these are all the communications um, between the two chips inside the module and what's waking us up inside there. Then we have our main file, main.c, and we also have a file called LoRa.c. So LoRa.c is our implementation of the LoRa stack. So this is our finite state machine sits inside here. And the main.c will be calling this LoRa.c file on a regular basis. So this is the main part of our application. Then we've got the drivers for doing scanf and uh, printf. So, so these are to do our communications. Then we've got the VCOM, so our virtual COM port. So this is providing us with our terminal interface so that we can talk there. And then we've got some more hardware related for the uh, microcontroller, so the interrupts and the actual core hardware file for the microcontroller. So that makes up the project side. So this is unique for every different project that we've got in the package. Then we've got our middlewares, so our LoRa Mac and our LoRa Mac um, security, so the crypto parts. So these are managed by Semtech. Then we've got our utilities. So these are the middlewares, again, that uh, are doing fu certain functions. So like time servers, low power modes, things like that. And then right at the bottom, we've got our proper full encryption engine that's part of the uh, LoRa stack as well. So the implementation of the LoRa package that we've got here. So it's split into three different areas. So we've got parts that are ST controlled, parts that are Semtech controlled, and then there's parts where there's been a collaboration between ST and Semtech. So anything that we're in control of is the HAL itself. So as I said, IO pins, SPI and RTC are all being directly used um, so that we can communicate with the radio and control time servers and things like that. So all the HAL and low layer drivers are all 100% controlled by ST. The sensor drivers, so, so there's um, potentially MEM sensors that you can have interfacing through the Arduino connectors. Um, these will be using I2C and ADC and a few other things. So all these sensor drivers, they're all ST provided. Um, so we're in control of those. The application can also talk directly to the HAL drivers for the, all the other periphery that's on the um, Murata module. So you can use them directly for the rest of your application. So all of that is just your application talking to ST drivers as you would with any STM32 design. Then we've got all the Mac area and the radio driver itself. This is all controlled by Semtech. Uh, we don't have access to this IP, so <clears throat> I can't really give you any details of what's actually going on in the Mac side of things or the radio side of things. Apart from we're using the SPI interface and some GPI opens to communicate with this radio driver chip. Then there's the block in the middle, which is the middlewares. So these are the time servers, low power, random number generation, and a few other utilities. Um, these ones are elements where Semtech control the functionality, 
but the functionality is using the ST hardware, so ST has to provide input on how best to use all these hardwares. So as I said earlier, the time servers, so these are providing the various timing functions that are going on in the LoRa stack. The tick for the time servers is controlled by the RTC. So, so the module that's called the time servers has to know how all the RTC works. It has to know how to configure the RTC and set the various alarms to wake it up um, to provide the relevant ticks um, to generate whichever timing event you're looking at. Same for the low power modes. So, so you have to know how to put the device into low power mode to get the best power consumption while you're asleep. So all of these are combined functions between ST and Semtech. So if we now have a look at the IEEE um, 802 protocol. So LoRa uses the principles of this. It's not the entire protocol. Uh, it doesn't use everything. It just uses the main principles. So normally the Mac user will send a request down to the Mac layer to say that it wants to send something. Uh, and then you'll normally get a confirm back from the Mac layer back to the Mac user to know that it's been received. When information arrives on the layer side, it will then send an indication out to the Mac user and the Mac user can send a response back if it chooses to do so. So these are the um, like the service primitives that we have of IEEE 802 and LoRa uses these service primitives. So the particular services that we're looking at are Mac Management Service or the Mac Layer Management Entity, so MLME. Uh, this provides all the um, management functions, so the join requests and things like that. And then we've also got Mac Data Services, which is the Mac Common Port Service, MCPS. And this is where all the data throughput goes from when you send or receive data across the physical layer. So, so if we look at this in... Um, respect to our software. So when the Mac layer receives a information over the radio side, it will send an indication to the Mac user, which will then generate a callback in the software so that you can go on action based on what indication you've received. Uh, and you can send a return back if you want. So within our software, so that callback will be the LoRa RX data subroutine. Um, and the indication that will be sent from the Mac layer to the Mac user will be RX data equals true. So this will let the, um, the software stack know that we've received a message over the radio. In this particular case, we don't send the confirmation. We don't have to send the confirmation back to the Mac layer. So this is our operation model of our class A device. So this is our finite state machine that is running in the LoRa.c um, software part of the uh, stack. So this is the process that we go through uh, when we power up the device and then it will sit in its infinite loop between sleep and send information. So as we power up our device, we will move into the initialization phase. So where we've set up all the parameters, set up the software, um, enable our duty cycle uh, function. Obviously, when you're doing your development, this will be disabled. And then you will move into the join state. So this is where you're waiting to be join an item. So you'll either do one of the two joins, you'll either do over the air or you'll be personalization. If you've got personalization, then your keys are already stored in there. So you will transition straight into the send uh, state and you can send your message at that point. If you're on the over the air, you will enable the join timer, send your information out 
and then you'll go to sleep at this point. Then, after some time event based on one of your time servers, you will either get one of two responses. You will either get, you've not joined. In that case, you will go back to the join state, reset your timer, and send all the information out again to join and go back to sleep. Or you will get, you have joined the network, so therefore you'll transition into the joined network where you can then start your transmission. So you'll then say joined will then become true. You then move into the send state and then you will join the infinite loop between send and sleep. So, so every time you send something, you'll send the information, prepare the next packet, and then go to sleep. When you've got a send event, you will wake up, check to make sure that you've joined, you are still joined, and then you'll go around that infinite loop um, until you downpower the system. So, so back to our IEEE protocol again. So our finite state machine is managing this protocol for us. So our callbacks are in our Mac user part. So this is our application layer, the Mac user part, um, where our finite state machine is and our callbacks. And down in the Mac layer, we have the Semtech software called lauramac.c. So that's managing the radio itself uh, for us. So, so what is in our software for LoRa.c? So, first part of most .c files is an initialization. So we have a LoRa initialization. So this will set up all our callbacks that are available for our transmit and our receive parameters. Then we have our finite state machine entry point. So we have our LoRa FSM routine. So this is what we'll be getting called on a regular basis. And then we'll have our actual two um, callbacks themselves. So the LoRa TX data callback and the LoRa RX data callback. So these are the four main elements of our LoRa.c file. We can also find out the state of where we are in our finite state machine. So there is a command for us to get device state and you'll then get one of those particular responses. So you'll either get you're in the init state, join, joined, send or sleep. There is one extra state there called cycle. So this means you've uh, just happened to have requested it while it's in between one of those defined uh, states that we have inside the finite state machine diagram. Some of the utilities that you could use were the time servers. So, so in the afternoon sessions in the hands-on we will create a time server ourselves. So, so the time servers are there. So again it's the same um, similar steps that we had for our state machine. So you will have an initialization part, which will set up the various callbacks for each particular timer server that you're creating. You'll be able to have a routine that sets the value of the timer server, so you can set the delay for um, which timer you want. And then you'll have two commands for start or stop the timer. So, so again, we will be using this in our example to control an LED. Um, so you can see how to use any of the timer servers that are available inside the system. So this is what sits in main.c. So this is the while one loop in main.c. Um, so we have there our LoRa FSM. So that's the uh, call to our LoRa state machine. So that's um, doing the process of what we're doing. And then under that, we have our command process. So this is uh, managing our AT commands that we're receiving. So every time we receive our AT command, we will then 
load that into our LoRa state machine to do whatever we want to do, which is send message, um, out, join the network, whatever else. Uh, all those then will go into our finite state machine. And down here at the bottom of the while one loop, we can keep entering low power mode all the time to make sure our device is consuming as little power as possible in our application. While you're doing development, potentially this part, you might not actually have in your software until you've got the process of the uh, communications all sorted out. So there are other functions inside there. So you saw one of these hardware.c files uh, in the software stack. So inside here, we've got extra functions uh, to do certain tasks. So in the last hands-on of the day, we will be getting the temperature sense, temperature level. So inside all STM32 devices, we have an embedded temperature sensor on one of the analog uh, ADC inputs. I think it's channel 17 um, and that gives us the temperature of the device so inside here we've got a um, support package our micro support package which is taking that temperature value and converting it into a degrees C value for us which is then what we will transmit out um, to the gateway in the last hands-on of the day there's also a routine for getting battery power. So if you're running the device off battery, you can use the ADC to monitor the battery levels. And there's a, a routine already pre-written to get battery level. There's routines for all the low power modes that we have on the STM32. And more routines to get the unique ID and communicate with other peripherals on the uh, device. So these are all pre-written uh, routines in the hardware uh, .c file that we have in the package. So parameterization. So the keys that we have stored inside the device and the unique ID and the application server address that we want to talk to are all stored in a file called commissioning.h. So this is where we are declaring all the information. So there's lots of different defines in here. Uh, we have got over the air activation defined as one. So we're going to use the over the air activation. Um, if we didn't have that enabled, then down here at the bottom, you can see our network session key is already stored in there and our application session key is already stored there. So again, depending on what the define for over the air is, will depend on if these two keys are going to actually be used in this particular example. So here you can see the device unique ID. You can see our LoRa application unique ID. So if you remember, that was what was stored in my gateway, all those 0x01s. Uh, and then we have our application key. So this is the address uh, the encryption key we're going to use to send the information out to our servers so that we can get our session keys back. So, so that's what we have programmed in there. So the two ones that are specific are the application key and the application unique ID. These are the two that are stored inside my multitech box. So the application key is so that I know how to decrypt my message. Uh, and the EUID is so that I know I'm talking to the correct gateway. So if we had more than one multitech gateway in the room, then we would need to change our application unique ID on one of the two gateways. So some of the other parameters that we're going, we were using inside our application. So we've got our duty cycle. Uh, so we're defining our duty cycle to be every 10 seconds. So again, we're um, not following the rules of the uh, regulator at the moment. Um, so we're broadcasting every 10 seconds there. We've enabled adaptive data rate. So if you remember, I said uh, you can set the adaptive data rate so the software um, will decide on 
certain parameters to try and maximize battery power based on signal strength. We've got confirm messages as disabled, and just as you do in um, Wi-Fi, so in the IEEE's, we have an application port as well. So you've got to define which port we're going to use um, inside the LoRaWAN application. Another couple of parameters in LoRa.c file. So LoRaWAN duty cycle on is true. So that means we're going to follow the rules inside our um, LoRaWAN. So on the AT command session, the messages are very small. It's the size of whatever command it is you've sent. Um, so therefore, the 10 second um, duty cycle that we've just programmed in our main.c is... Um, within the limits of the um, EU regulations. So we're saying that we're going to be true here. And then we've also got our over-the-air activation duty cycle. So this is what happens when, if your join fails first time round, uh, you will then have to wait 10 seconds before your system will go and try and join again. So this is abiding by all the regular regulatory rules uh, that we have available. So, so we're actually following the rule book here in this particular example. For basic debug, um, we've got the VCOM, so we're doing our virtual COM port. Uh, in this particular example, we are setting our board rate to 9,600. Uh, the reason we are doing this is because we are using the low power UART and the prescalers in the low power UART, because it's based on the RTC crystal, so the 32 kilohertz crystal, the largest board rate we can get from this particular UART is 9,600. So this is so we can send all the information out to our terminal window uh, and control the system from our laptops. So in this particular example, we are losing all the low power modes so we keep dropping into stop mode at all times and we wait the MCU up, process our information and then drop straight back down into stop mode. So we are using the system as a full low power based system in these examples. The afternoon examples we'll be using the standard UART so we'll be on a higher board rate uh, because we're doing development work and we're not using the full stop mode at that point. Some other basic features we have in the debug. Um, we have some other pins that we can monitor uh, to show what is going on inside the application. So PBs 13, 14 and 15, they can be monitored to see wake up time calculations, how, which mode you're in, if you're in sleep mode or not, and if you're in stop mode. So, so you can monitor a few extra things there. There are some extra debugs for hash defines that you can remove, and these will add extra debug features in there, so like the debug printf, where you can actually get more information out of the system uh, as well. So it's all integrated inside the um, software stack that we're providing you in the iCube LR1 package. So here's a scope trace of PB15. So this is monitoring the stop activity. So you can see there the device wakes up to do its transmission. Then it goes back to sleep. There is a very small spike there as it's the uh, finite state machine starts one of the software time bases. One second after end of transmission, uh, you can see that we wake up and that's one second is our programmed wait state to open our first Rx window. Uh, then it goes back to sleep again, and then you can see another software timer uh, happens a bit further on. If we didn't receive a message back in our first Rx window, then there would be a second Rx window opening another one second uh, after the uh, first Rx window. So if we zoom in there now on our transmission part, 
So you can see there that we are awake for 20 milliseconds in there. And inside there, remember, there's all the preamble and everything else, the payload, the error correction, as well as the two bytes that we're actually sending. So you can send up to 220 bytes as the maximum payload, but our particular message there is only two bytes long um, included inside that payload. So you can also um, uncomment the define load power mode disable. Uh, this means that you don't keep dropping into all the low power modes um, and it means you can do more debugging, um, etc. without having to keep disconnecting your um, ST-Link at that point. So there's a few more commands that are available inside the package.